Welcome to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today, we're talking with ex-Big Law recruiter Sadie Jones about preparing for the 1L job hunt, and we'll also talk about the impact your 1L job might or might not have on your future job prospects. Your Law School Toolbox host today is Allison Monahan, and typically I'm here with Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so that you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career website, Career Dicta. I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes or your favorite app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with ex recruiter Sadie Jones about preparing for the 1L job hunt, and we'll also talk a bit about what impact this job might have or might not have on your future job prospects. Well, actually, first off, how critical is this 1L summer job? And if you don't get the exact job that you're aiming for, is your legal career over? Uh, First of all, thank you for having me back. Thanks. And um, I would say no, your legal career is certainly not over if you don't get the exact job you were looking for. Because I'm kind of thinking maybe like I'm a 1L, I might want to work for Cravath. Right. Which is uh, possible. My law school roommate did it, but it's very rare. <laughs> well, I think there are the occasional law firm jobs. Um, and I think there are lots of great opportunities for 1Ls. And basically, my advice would be you want to get something where you're getting some legal experience where, you know, you're learning to work in that environment where you're going to have people who are going to be able to give you a recommendation for the next year, mm-hmm. uh, where you're going to meet people and really just get some experience under your belt. Right. I mean, that's kind of what I've always heard about the 1L job is that it's really important to do something that's legally related, but it's really not all that important what it is. So, you know, if you think eventually you might want a firm job, you don't have to get a firm job now. I mean, I think if you think you're going to do public interest, it can be useful to do a public interest option. But, you know, if you want to go in-house, I mean, obviously you're probably not going to get an in-house job as a 1L. This is not going to happen. Um, and people don't expect that. I mean, I think that's a key takeaway too, is no one really expects that you're going to be working for like, you know, this incredibly impressive organization and getting paid tons of money after your first year of law school. I mean, a few people do that, but that's rare. But they want to see something. And also you need to have something to talk about in these later interviews. Exactly. And I think that, you know, even if you want a firm job down the road, there's nothing wrong with doing a public interest job. You're one all summer working for a judge, um, doing something where maybe you're not going to get paid very much. I think it's more important to focus on what the experience is going to be and what's, you know, the best experience you can have for that summer. And I think firms don't really expect that you're probably going to get a firm job one all summer. So you really don't have anything to lose there. Yeah. And I think honestly, I mean, even if you do think that's a pathway you're going to go down, I think it can be beneficial to do something else your first summer. Um, because, you know, the reality is most people don't really stay at law firms that long. And you're probably going to be looking for another job at some point, you know, say three to five years after graduating from law school. And at that point, you might consider going back to the idea of the things that brought you to law school to begin with, which, you know, frankly, is probably not big law work. So, you know, I think that can be a good way to show like, oh, you know, this is something I've been interested in. This is an area like I'm passionate about. When I had the opportunities at 1L, I went and did a summer of low pay or no paid work for this organization. I agree. And I would do something that you're interested in if you can. For sure. Um, I mean, and the money thing is actually a key point. I mean, I'll, it's important to know a lot of schools actually provide some sort of public interest stipend. Um, and you want to understand at your school how that works. I mean, I know when I was a 1L, some of the funding actually was handed out very, very early. Um, and so people who didn't realize that kind of missed their shot. I think it's a little easier now. I think a lot of the top schools just sort of give you the money. At that time, you had to more of apply for it. Uh, but you want to understand like what your options are. And if your school doesn't have any sort of public interest funding, you know, are there outside organizations that might, are there campus groups that might, you know, these are the things you want to be looking at. And if not, you know, you've got to figure out how you're going to pay your rent and eat. Absolutely. And I agree <laughs> that I would 
look early. I think it can be overwhelming starting law school and getting used to classes. And then you feel like you're right into the job search because these job searches in law school tend to start early. But if you can kind of get a handle on it and start thinking about it, you know, in your first semester, I think that you're going to be better off than other people who maybe haven't given it that much thought. I think that's right. Because the reality, I mean, let's talk about some of the basics here. The reality here is one else can actually start applying for summer jobs at the latest by December 1st, which I was shocked about. You know, like you're just basically like you're getting ready to take your exams your first semester and suddenly there's this deadline of like, oh my gosh, oh, you think you might want to work for like an organization that's hiring you know, for the summer, it's time for you to start applying. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, how is this possible? Um, and and then, the reality is that a lot of firms are looking at you before you even have all your grades in. Oh, sure. Uh, so they're making, you know, lots of decisions. So actually, that's a real opportunity to kind of sell yourself without that. Yeah, I think in my case, so basically, just to give people sort of a really basic background, there's this organization called NALP. Do you remember what that stands for? National Association of Legal Professionals. Right, okay, that's what I thought too. I figured you'd have more expertise. Um, But NALP is kind of the overarching organization that has essentially best practices and standards that they kind of enforce um, about job hiring for certain types of organizations. Um, and most of these, if you look, they have actually a really extensive database or directory called the NALP directory. And that has a lot of job openings. Most of those openings are big law. Um, so, you know, a job that you're interested in may or may not be covered by this, but assuming it is covered by the NALP guidelines, you can apply starting on December 1st. And if this is something you're interested in, Obviously, you need to have your resume, your cover letter, your plan ready to go well before then because you don't have time December 1st to be like starting this project. Correct. And I can tell you as a legal recruiter, I certainly got a lot of resumes at midnight on December 1st. Uh, People are ready to go, but not usually as many as I would expect, especially Mm. when we've indicated that we at least may be looking at one else. So I would say, you know, don't just assume that those jobs don't exist. You know, it's it is a long shot, but you should try. And I was always surprised at how many people didn't even put themselves out there. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think if somebody's listening to this, you know, a couple of months before, and they're like, oh, of course I would be ready to go on December 1st and apply for these high paid big law summer jobs. That sounds great. But the reality is, you know, the timing on it is just awful. <laughs> and, you know, I remember sitting, this is back in the day before we could just apply electronically, where, you know, sitting on the floor with my roommate, hand stuffing envelopes full of like fancy cranes paper where it was like such a nightmare <laughs> to get them to print the right way with like yeah. the right logo. You know, you're just like, I cannot believe I'm spending hours on this. I think we at some point just put on a movie and both of us just sat there and stuffed like a hundred envelopes. I mean, the reality is both of us ended up getting a job. So, you know, I mean, I don't think either of us actually got a job through that exact process, but we did both get firm jobs. So I don't know. I mean, it kind of worked, I guess. It was worth doing. Absolutely. I just feel like there really isn't much to lose except for some time. And even if you don't get hired for that job, maybe they like you. Maybe they remember you. Maybe they meet you the next year and you, you know, you, you interviewed with them or, or they just remember your name. So. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I think particularly if you get an interview as a 1L, even if you don't get hired, you know, that says a lot about their interest level for bringing you back the next year. And certainly, you know, I think that's something you could mention. Hey, you know, I loved the opportunity. It was so great to go and meet some of your people when I interviewed as a 1L. You know, mm-hmm. I, I ended up working at wherever you ended up working, you know, the Children's Defense Fund for the summer, which was fantastic. But I really enjoyed my experience. And I'd love to talk to you about being there as a 2L. I mean, you know, that looks yeah. good. And I, I really did remember the really interested 1Ls who kept up with it and came to our events and panels. And I I did really know their names. So let's talk about that. So what are you talking about when you say like events, panels, like what are these? So I mean, really, they're networking opportunities for firms to get to meet 
people early in their legal career and for law students to get to know the names of firms. So it kind of creates good buzz on campus. Mm -hmm. Um, And it could be a variety of things. It could just be a cocktail party. Uh, A lot of times we would do different panels with speakers about, you know, a variety of topics, uh, diversity or a practice group or, or whatnot. And I would say, I think that sometimes 1Ls are bombarded with this stuff during a certain time of year, and maybe they don't even know why it's important. But if I were doing this, I would try to go to as many as I could, as long as the firm is, you know, something you might be interested in. Mm -hmm. Because again, people really do remember you if you make a good impression and you talk to people and you're comfortable socially always helpful (laughs) or you can make a bad impression um yeah (laughs) yeah, i remember they had in the second semester particularly they had a lot of these on campus um at my law school and you know some people treated it as just kind of a midweek opportunity to go get drunk on someone else's money um and you know a lot of these were people who were like well i would never apply for a firm job i'm not going to even do oci and then you know they make a complete like you know not so favorable impression of themselves and i'm sure people remembered and then the next you know, OCI rolls around and you see them in their suit ready to go. And suddenly it's like, oh, you're interviewing at that firm? Really? Do you remember how drunk you were at their cocktail party? (laughs) Like, I bet they remember. (laughs) I think it's really important to keep in mind that you don't know where you're going to end up or what you're going to uh, want or need to do in the future. So always making a good impression and always keeping it you know, professional, I think is important. And it's fine if you go to these things for some free food and drinks. I think that's expected. And maybe there are places you don't think you're interested in, but you never know. And you never know where those people might work at some other time. Yeah, and they exactly. you there and they remember you. I think that's the key thing too. Like people are moving around all the time to all sorts of different places in the legal profession. And once you have a reputation that is not favorable, they're probably going to remember you wherever they land. And you never know when your resume is going to cross that desk. Um, okay, great. So basically December 1st is our like deadline. If you're really serious about this, um, you can officially get help from career services at your campus for your resume, things like that, starting on October 15th. And so that I think is something people definitely probably want to take advantage of. We have an entire episode that we've done on resume and cover letters with Sadie, which has some great information. But, you know, these are things that you can be working on now so that you have a plan and you're ready to go. And all you have to do is, you know, push that button on midnight and then move on with your life. Absolutely. I think you should always have a current resume. You can always add to it, Um, you know, and make sure it's up to date. So as you, you know, do different activities or get grades back, you know, add to it, make sure it's, it's the latest version. Um, but you should always have it available. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, you never know who you're going to meet, who just says, oh, shoot me a resume. My friend might be interested in hiring you. Because the reality is, let's face it, most people are not getting now big firm jobs their first summer. <laughs> this is pretty True. rare. It's very, they're hard to get. But if you you know, if it's a possibility, I would say you should be trying really hard for it. Yeah, I think. And I mean, give me an idea of who would it be like a reasonable possibility for that they should actually give it a shot. So I would say, I mean, I think depending on the firm, there's a certain level of sort of school and academics and all of that. That's, you know, the basics that they're probably not going to look at anyone who doesn't fit that basic criteria. Mm -hmm. But like I said before, a lot of times, Maybe you have a few grades back. Maybe they're even talking to you before you have their grades back. They're probably not going to make you an offer until they see some grades. But you have a real chance to make an impression without that at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And what they really want is someone enthusiastic, someone who's going to be a great 1L ambassador. So they want someone who's involved in activities, who seems genuinely excited about the firm. Um, You know, a lot of reason that firms don't hire one else is because most firms don't have a great track record of converting one else into future associates. Mm -hmm. Um, Although I can say that I had a pretty good track record, not a hundred percent, but I would say 75%. Uh, That's very high. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons was at my firm, we gave full offers after their one all summer. It wasn't like an offer to come back. Mm. So to a lot of people that was like, if they knew they liked the firm, they didn't necessarily want to try something else. Right. Uh, the thing that's great about being a 1L is you kind of get a free summer and you probably will get an offer at that firm. And then you get to go to another firm or split your summer the next year. 
So which can really that- extend the number of weeks that you are working because that's what I did and. I did, you know, a normal 2L summer, and then I tacked on like two or three weeks at the firm I'd worked for as a 1L, which is like free money. They already like me. Like, I don't need to do any work. Like, nobody expects me to do anything. They just want me to come and hang out, you know, and say nice things. Uh, And then in the end, like, I hated the firm I worked at my 2L summer. So it actually was a really good fallback option that honestly, like, if I'd stayed in New York, I would have very seriously considered. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just, that is a freebie that, other people aren't going to have because it's very hard to like find a three all summer job right. where it would be like that. So what they really want is a great ambassador on campus. Uh, so I, I would say that's what you want to show is like, who are you? What about diversity? Like, are they looking for sort of diverse candidates to kind of mix it up a little bit? Yes. Uh, I think that is very important and it's especially important with one else. Um, and, you know, firms get a different, choice of people one all summer than they would get two all summer. Sure, so maybe they get a chance at people that would be harder for them to recruit as a two L because they would have a lot more options. Yeah. I think so, that particularly applies to sort of like the more mid market firms, particularly in a city like New York, you know, where it's like, there's so many firms, there's so many people, there's so many schools, you know, they're going to have a shot at people that wouldn't probably look at them for the 2L summer. And then as you're saying, like the whole goal is that you go back and you're like, oh, you know, yeah, I had a really great experience. They were so nice. Like I really liked it. And then someone else from that school who maybe like doesn't have a shot at the very top schools or top firms, they might say, oh, I'd love to. I mean, that's actually what happened to me. Like, you know, basically I recruited people for them that I thought were great, that I would be a really good fit. And they loved them. You know? <laughs> so. well, and I, that's why to the firm, I don't know that it's super important that they do convert that person into a real associate. It's great if they like them. But really, if they find them a bunch of other people and kind of can develop their reputation on campus, that's what the firm really wants from you as a 1L. So I think diversity is important, your activities, um, you know, your excitement about the firm. Obviously, academics are still important. Right. Yeah. And I mean, again, like it's kind of a long shot, let's face it. So let's let's move on to, well, I guess first off, I mean, people are going to find these opportunities basically in the NAP directory. It's possible that career services may also send emails or have a database. I mean, one thing that I hear from people sometimes that I find astonishing is they're like, well, I get all these emails from career services, but I just don't really look at them. And it's like, okay, I get that, like, you have a lot going on, but these are people who basically are trying to find you a job and are sending you job options. You might want to check this out. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. And I think that's where the events come come into play also, True. and not just from firms, from all different organizations. Because again, I think networking is really key as a 1L, mm-hmm. like to leverage your own network, to meet new people, to put yourself out there, to see if there are job fairs. There can be one L job fair. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and again, certain people are going to interview on campus. It's a it's a rare thing, but I've done it before, and I was surprised that a lot of one L didn't even know what that was. Yeah, I just feel like people are not paying a lot of attention sometimes. So, like, I understand. Okay, you get a lot of annoying emails from career services, but you really ought to consider at least filtering these into a special folder and then reviewing them fairly regularly, like several times a week, because these are not opportunities that you want to miss. <laughs> you know, like, I agree. I would keep it really organized. And I think filtering is a great way to do that. I would also swing by career services and see if they have things posted. Like maybe you didn't get an email. Yeah, exactly. Or even just make friends there. You know, I mean, that's one of those places where having an ally on the inside who knows what you're looking for and knows you and is invested in your success and likes you and might be willing to shoot you an email being like, hey, just thought you might be interested in this great opportunity, you know, that we sent out or put on a job board, but nobody's paying attention to seems to write up your alley. You know, that's highly valuable. So make these people your allies, I think. Also, I mean, yeah, they're the people who are talking to the employers and employers may say to them, hey, do you have anyone in mind? Mm -hmm. And so you want to be someone who's at the top of that list. Yeah, I think there's just no downside really to, you know, trying to make these people your friends. And I mean, I have friends who work in career services and a lot of them are kind of depressed, particularly like the first semester because they're like, nobody's coming to talk to me. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I have all this great information and great resources and I try to get people to come in and I feel like they just don't. (laughs) 
Um, I agree. So point being, like you have a real opportunity to stand out here. If you make an appointment, it, let them know what you're looking for, maybe drop a resume, get some advice, and then just pop by occasionally. You know, you can bring cookies. <laughs> it's not going to hurt. Um, so you mentioned job fairs. So I think that's a really important place that people can look for work, uh, particularly if you are interested in public interest work. Um, there is a large nationwide job fair essentially run by equal justice works uh, i think it's happening in late october usually so that's not necessarily like the greatest opportunity for one l's unfortunately because it's so early that you really have to be paying attention and plan ahead but you know if you look at their website it does say look we accept one l's you can show up you can do drop-in interviews you know if there's any way you can get there i think that's totally worth it um if not keep it in mind for next year when you're looking for your 2l job um, and PSJD on their website actually has a list of public interest career fairs, most of which are later They're in January and February. So that is a great option if, you know, you strike out with your, you know, unlikely big law hunt, or you just don't get around to things because you are taking exams and you want to focus on your grades, which is also completely legitimate. But this means that when you come up for air in January or February, Hopefully you've had the winter break to kind of work on your materials, you know, get your ducks in a row, and then you can go out and do some interviews and hopefully find something that's really interesting. Um, I don't actually know exactly when judges hire. That's also a great option uh, as an extern for a judge um, where you work in chambers and you're basically kind of like a mini clerk. Um, A lot of times the schools will post that. I don't know. Yeah, you probably, I think there might be a website also that might keep track of all of them. Uh, but I, I don't think it's like a set process. So I think you might want to, you know, do some research about who are the local judges. Exactly. And, uh, you know, do a little more legwork on that. But I agree. I would say at a firm, most of the resumes I saw during their one all year, they either worked for a judge or did public interest work. Right. I mean, and those, either one is totally acceptable. Yeah. And those are jobs that, you know, are much easier to find um, and are super interesting. I mean, another good thing about those is you actually get probably more on the ground legal experience than mm-hmm. you're going to get, you know, working at a firm or something like that. Um, you know, I know Lee, I think, worked in the DA's office or for the U.S. attorney. I can't remember which one, but one of those. And, you know, her first day, basically, she was sort of thrown into court. And they're like, okay, we're going to kind of deputize you. And then, I mean, you know, there were misdemeanor cases. It's more like felony murder. But, <laughs> you know, she you know, she got to stand up after her first year of law school and say, you know, may it please the court, I represent the state of California. And, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um and it gives I, agree. You- I would focus, like I said before, really on the experience you're going to get mm-hmm. uh, and really think about it and, and think about what would be helpful and what, you know, is going to help your own development, too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of different options. And you might think, oh, well, I'm not really interested in public interest. I want to do entertainment law. It's like, oh, well, do you know about volunteer lawyers for the arts? Maybe that's up your alley mm-hmm. you know, or whatever it is like. I feel like there's almost a public interest organization for any topic that someone could possibly be interested in. Um, you know, there are a lot of government programs, too. Some of these even hire earlier because you have to do an extensive background check, you know, if you're going to work for, like, the FBI or something. Um, but those are options. You know, I think the really the one old job search, like, the world is almost your oyster. And I think it, it's an opportunity for you to be flexible And to really explore something that you actually are interested in. (laughs) I would also say, you know, take advantage of upperclassmen who are either mentors or would be open to giving you advice. Like talk to a lot of people about what they did, how they found out about it. I Mm -hmm. think they're sort of the best resources. Yeah, because I think those personal connections are often how people land these jobs. I mean, like one of our writers that we did a podcast with, Charlene, she was working, I can't remember if it was Lexus or Westlaw, but, you know, on campus rep and was talking to her supervisor about how she was stressed out about not having a summer job. And her supervisor said, oh, well, you know, I think a friend of mine is looking to hire someone like at this small firm. Would you be interested in working there? Answer, yes. You know, <laughs> So it's not like these things are just going to fall into your lap. But I think the more you put yourself out there, 
in a nice way, you know, just an exploratory way, not like I need a job right now. Like who's going to help me? Um, that people are, are going to be willing to help you. And if they can match you up with someone who's looking for, you know, a, a new, newly minted law student slash, you know, young lawyer type to work for them, like, great, bonus, win-win. Mm-hmm. And I would say, sounds small, but offer to buy someone coffee. Yeah, exactly. Or I mean, to do something for someone. Yeah, I have a whole series on the Girls Guide about how to do good informational interviews, everything from you know, literally like what to write in that first email that you cold email someone. But the reality is people are actually willing to help you. Um, I think bar association events also can be a great opportunity. Some of them even have, you know, networking or job search type of things for one L's and two L's. You know, these are the things that are high value activities that you just really need to be putting yourself out in. Because you and just I would don't say know. If there like, is a certain practice group you're interested in or an area you're interested in, get involved in whatever they have on campus related to that because they're probably going to have connections in that area. True. I mean, I remember going to events on campus for speakers and there might be 10 people in the audience or sometimes or even five people, you know, if it was a very specific topic or at a weird time. And at that point, like you can go up and talk to the speaker and Again, like these are, you know, pretty high profile people. Oftentimes they've already made the effort to come and give this talk. I'm sure they would appreciate someone coming and saying, oh, you know, I really enjoyed the talk that you just gave on structuring transactions, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, presuming you're interested in this, Um, you know, I'm interested in getting this area. Do you have any thoughts on how I might do that or what kind of job I might look for? Blah, blah, blah. Um, And I would say I think one else may not realize that these things are geared towards them. And so as a, on the firm side or the employer side, we did this stuff specifically for one else, but it would be open to everybody Hmm. because you can't necessarily say that. And I think, and a lot of times it would be filled with three L's, um, you know, who are still looking for jobs, which is fine. But I would say I, I was surprised that one else didn't seem to realize that these things were going to be helpful, helpful for them or important. Right. Well, I mean, I think they're not necessarily getting like the greatest information. And so hopefully if you're listening to this, really make an effort to figure out what is available on your campus. What are people doing? Show up to those things. Yes, you're busy, but, you know, finding a job is kind of one of the key aspects of law school. So you can definitely take an hour or two off and go to a panel discussion or go to a networking party and actually meet some people and you just never know. Um All right, so let's talk, I'll drill down a little bit more because I know a lot of people who are listening are probably thinking, okay, I'm going to do OCI, I'm going to talk about this job. What are firms really looking for in terms of future impact? I mean, are there any types of jobs that you would think badly of, some that you find more or less impressive? You know, not that much, I have to say, Um, because as we've said, there's such a wide variety. I think if you didn't have a legal job or you didn't have anything related and you, you know, just had whatever summer job you had in undergrad, that would probably be an issue. Yeah. Um, And sometimes people come to us with questions and they say, well, what if I can't afford to do an unpaid legal job, which is a totally valid question. My response there is usually work, try to find something at least part-time to put on your resume and you work for free and then you can work you know, in the evening or whatever it is, like in your off days, and you don't have to put that on the resume, but you want to have something. I was going to say, I think there's a way to do it where you're still, you have something legal on your resume. Um, I also think you've probably put so much time and money into going to law school that it would kind of make the whole thing a waste. Yeah. I mean, you have to look at your like sunk cost at this point. (laughs) So I think you have to keep that. But I would say really, like I said, um, public interest, um, working for a judge, you know, maybe there is some kind of small firm job, Mm -hmm. uh, not really paying you much. It's not like a big firm where they're paying you as an associate a lot of money. But I saw a lot of that. And I think you can learn a lot from those kind of jobs. Um, So I think you have to think, okay, what would I be doing at this job? And how could I just like talk about it a little bit? Yeah, I think one other consideration is location. So if you know that you're going to be interviewing later in a city that's not where you're going to school or maybe not where you have a lot of connections, 
this 1L summer can be an opportunity to sort of create those connections. You know, I knew someone who really wanted to be in San Francisco, but had had never any connections there. And she basically pounded the pavement and found a small firm who would hire her there because then the next summer, it's so much easier to say, well, I worked in San Francisco in the legal community last summer and I really enjoyed it. And I think it's definitely a great fit. Like that's going to be a lot easier story than no, I've never really actually been here except on vacation. That's an excellent point. And I saw a lot of people who did have that in their resume. And usually I would think, oh, I wonder how they ended up there. It doesn't seem like they have any other connections. But the truth is, if you, you got yourself there, you probably didn't get your transportation paid for and you lived there and you made it work that says so much about your commitment to the city yeah exactly. Uh, so I think that's an excellent point I mean I also think it's not the end of the world if like you tried out the city and realized it wasn't for you and it's better to figure that out now oh, for sure. to interview all your two L uh, jobs there yeah I completely agree so I mean basically this one L job is pretty flexible I think the most important thing is just find something that's going to get you good experience, give you something to talk about, give you something to put on your resume for later, maybe work your location. Um, but honestly, like once you find something, I feel like people just don't really need to stress that much over this. Use the time period when this 1L sort of time is going on to again, like network and think about your 2L summer because that's going to be the more important summer. Um, so yeah, so aside from just finding the job, I would use the time and, you know, like I said, events and job fairs and all that stuff to try to like meet people in areas that you're interested in. Yeah, and I think it's also worth, you know, reading some career books or maybe doing some career counseling about what are you really interested in, what's going to work long term for you, that kind of thing. Um, so one question mm-hmm. I get a lot, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, if not, I can talk about it a little bit. So we get a lot of questions from people say like come March or even April who are really struggling to find something like what should these people be doing? Well, again, I would go back to, I mean, some of the advice we talked about before, which is have you exhausted your network? Because I think it's very rare that there aren't more people you can reach out to. <laughs> yeah, there's always someone. Um, there's always someone who knows someone, like keep the chain going. Um, I would really be going to career services and saying, I'm in this difficult situation. They want you to find a job. It For is sure. their job to make sure you find a job. Um, so I think that you just need to make sure that you've really looked at all of the possibilities. Um, I don't know if you have more advice about kind yeah. of last oh, yeah. I completely agree. I mean, the reality is the 1L job search is probably the hardest job search you'll do Um, just because you don't really have much experience. Like there aren't a whole lot of people who are willing to pay you a lot of money to do these things. And if they are, it's incredibly competitive. I mean, you just have to keep pounding the pavement. There's really no other option. Um, And you may have to face the fact that you may have to do something where you're not really paid. Well, I think at that point, you're probably not going to be paid. Yeah. I mean, the reality is if you don't have a job and you don't have funding by March, you're probably not going to be paid unless your school is one of those where it's like, well, if you find a public interest job, we will pay for you, in which case, great. But yeah, I mean, I think by March or April, you've got to accept the reality. You're probably going to be working for free. You are probably going to have to just take sort of whatever comes along that you can find, but that's fine. You know, it's not the end of the world. It's not a disaster. You can learn something and basically any type of legal work that you're doing. And worst case, you find out you never want to do this type of work again. I I agree. And I also think that if you do want to do the work and you find something and maybe it's not, you know, it's not great and it's not paid and it's not exactly what you were thinking, there is always a way to spin that job later and figure out a way to put it in the best light. Um, I've seen a lot of stuff where, you know, we've come up with stories and explanations and I don't think the firm really notices. No, I don't think people care. I mean, it's really just, you need something to talk about. It just, I agree with you. I think the worst case scenario is just that people do something that's not at all legally related. Uh, One question. So sometimes people come to me and they're like, well, I haven't really found a job yet. Is it okay if I do study abroad? How do really? you view that? <laughs> like law school um, study abroad <laughs> for that summer? Well, I mean, I guess it's better than doing nothing. <laughs> um, I guess I would try to figure out if there's a way hmm, that you can 
I'm trying to think if you're abroad, whether you could even work anywhere. Yeah, like, that would be my suggestion. Can you intern? You know, yeah. I mean, honestly, that's, like, that's I would say that's that. probably, I mean, that to me is like, you're really, you. Have, it's one of your worst case scenarios. Like, okay, you know, your parents are willing to pay for this. Maybe a vacation in France doesn't sound that bad, but I don't think it looks great yeah, for your later I applications. Agree. Unless you have, unless you have some kind of set thing where you know you're going to get something two all year like so you don't have to worry about your one all year you have some kind of connection you feel really confident in it um but I think if you're just out there trying to find a job that's probably not going to look great you're going to have to explain it in some way yeah I, agree. Uh, I, mean, I would I would think it would be better to take a job that's not particularly legal related but maybe sort of business related or whatever more than that yeah, that you can at least spin is like, well, I worked in a startup because I really want to do internet law or whatever. You know, I mean, yeah. that's that's feasible too. But I think the takeaway message is really, really, really try your best to find something that is legal, and then beyond that, don't worry about it too much. Yeah, and I would imagine those people where it's March or April and they don't have anything, they did not take our advice about starting early. Well, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> they probably don't. I mean, yeah. if basically if you start early. And you do a serious effort of going to some job fairs in January and February, you really probably will find something by March or April. I'm not guaranteeing it, but I think your odds are pretty good. Like most people find something. I agree. And, you know, they're not all the top students. And, you know, I I don't think you have to worry about, you know, being the best in your class to get that. I think people at all levels are finding things. Exactly. All right. Any final thoughts for our eager 1L job seekers? Uh, I would say practice your interviewing skills before you get out there. Good point. (laughs) Because you probably haven't done it in this environment before. Uh, And so I would say I would really, even if it's going to be painful and you're going to have to get feedback, I know... A lot of schools have 1L mock interviews, Mm -hmm. and I was surprised at how few people really sign up for them. This seems to be a recurring theme. (laughs) We're surprised by how little 1Ls are taking advantage of the things that are designed to help them find work. A a 1L mock interview is, is such a good opportunity. Oh, for sure. And I mean, you can even, you know, if you can't do it officially, you can have friends do an interview with you, record that. Yes, it will be painful, but I guarantee you, you will learn something. And my final, final advice is read over your resume and cover letter, have at least two or three other people read them over for any mistakes and make sure that when you're addressing things, you're addressing it to the right firm and the right person and spell their name right. Yeah, this is definitely a place where attention to detail is critical. No one is going to hire you if you send in a type a resume full of typos. Like that is not the type of person that they're looking for to help them do a better job at their own work, which is actually why they're hiring you. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's why that's my final piece of advice. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for joining us with that. We are unfortunately out of time. But we really appreciate your time in coming on and giving your advice. Thank you. Our pleasure. Uh, If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on iTunes or your favorite app because we would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. Our new episodes come out on Monday. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. And you can always contact us via our website contact form at, you guessed it, lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening. We'll talk soon and good luck finding a summer job. Thank you.